Let's talk about Bosnia and Herzegovina and why peace there is under threat. The Bosnian Serb leader Milorad Dodik is threatening to pull out of state-level institutions. It's the worst political crisis in Bosnia since the devastating war in the 1990s. The Dayton Peace Agreement, which ended that war, is now being seriously tested and many people are scared about where this could be going. It's the first time that this crisis mode has brought back anxiety uh, that has lingered uh, beneath the surface since the 1990s. So what's been going on? Why do some people think the US and EU haven't done enough? And how does the political system in Bosnia work or not work? Bosnia is home to three main ethnic groups, the Bosniaks, who are mostly Muslim, the Serbs, who are mostly Orthodox Christian, and the Croats, they're mostly Catholic. And don't get confused with Serbians or Croatians, which is what people from Serbia and Croatia are called, although they share history, tradition, and religion with the Serbs and Croats. Now, Bosnia's ethnic divisions were a big part of the war that happened in the 1990s. After Yugoslavia broke up, there was a power vacuum, and all those ethnic groups started fighting each other for territory. In 1992, the UN recognized Bosnia and Herzegovina's independence, and that didn't go down well with Serbs. Various Serb forces attacked, and that was the start of the Bosnian War. Fighting went on for three and a half years. Atrocities were committed by all sides. Roughly 100,000 people were killed, about 80% were Bosniaks. In the town of Srebrenica, Serb forces killed more than 8,000 Bosnian Muslims, men and boys. A UN tribunal later called it a genocide. The war ended in 1995 with the Dayton Peace Agreement, a deal brokered by the US. Europe and Russia were also involved. It included a new constitution for Bosnia that tried to balance political power between the Bosniaks, Serbs, and Croats. But in many ways, that constitution only reinforced those ethnic divisions. For the first two years after, after the Dayton Peace Agreement, the country became more divided. I mean, people moved to make sure they were on the right side of the line. The only major flaw within that agreement is that it presupposed a willingness of ethnic elites to actually cooperate, which has never been there. So keep that in mind while we tell you what the system looks like. There's the state level that deals with the whole country, but instead of one president at the top, they have what's called a tripartite presidency. It means three people share the presidency, and it's always one Bosniak, one Croat, and one Serb. There's also a prime minister and a parliament at the state level. And this is where things like foreign policy and the army are dealt with. At the next level down, you've got two self-governing entities. There's Republika Srpska and the Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina. And don't confuse the federation with the name of the country. And there are more layers of government below those. But there's another layer we need to talk about, and that's back at the top, the high representative. Sort of a viceroy, you could say, somebody who sits on top of all of this. He, it's always been a he, by the way, oversees policymaking. So this position is there to ensure the safe implementation of the Dayton Peace Agreement. The high representative is never a Bosnian. They're usually from the EU, the current one's German. So in some ways, you can think of Bosnia as a kind of protectorate. It really depends on the international community, especially the US and EU, to keep the peace. The whole system is completely rooted in the Dayton Agreement. But right now, that system is looking a bit shaky. A lot of that has to do with this man, Milorad Dodik. He's the Serb member of the tripartite presidency. Dodik has been in power since 2006. Initially, he was a reformist, and this has changed throughout the past decade. By adopting a more nationalist rhetoric, Dodik has seen that he can actually get more electoral support. And that rhetoric has risen in the last few months. <laughs> Dodik threatened to pull out Republika Srpska from the main state-level institutions, the judiciary, the tax authority, and the army, and set up separate Serb ones. In the other Bosnian entity, Federation of Bosnia-Herzegovina, uh, politicians and public 
see all those announcements as uh, basically declaring the Republic of Srpska independent. Serb politicians have also been refusing to participate in many state-level institutions. It's paralyzing the system and nothing's really getting done. And then in Republika Srpska, they went ahead with celebrations to mark what they call their national day, which Bosnia's top court has ruled illegal. The sentiment that Republika Srpska should, should be independent has always been had some traction in RS from, from the very end of the war. And Dodik has tapped into that, but amplified it. Now, there are a couple reasons why things have heated up so much lately. Last July, the high representative at the time, remember that's the top foreign official we talked about earlier, he brought in a new law to make genocide denial a crime. It's something that Bosniaks in particular have been calling for for a while. The law doesn't single out any ethnic group, but many Serbs feel the law unfairly targets them, and Dodik and his allies have pushed this idea too. This is interpreted by the political elite in Republika Srpska as being against that part of the nation. Concerning this genocide law and the uh, opinion in the public here in Republika Srpska, why they keep denying it, why they keep uh, not believing the information from Srebrenica, it's because uh, they think that um, war crimes committed against Serbs are not discussed at all. There's another big thing going on that Dodik is unhappy about. It's a long-running dispute over public agricultural land within Republika Srpska. Dodik insists it belongs to Republika Srpska, but Bosnia's constitutional court declared it belongs to the state. So Dodik wants that decision overturned, and he's using it as a bargaining chip. Basically to say, if you guys overturn this constitutional court ruling, then I might, you know, I'll come back to institutions. Now there's another dimension to all of this. Elections, which are in October. It means a lot of politicians are riled up, including Dodik. This sort of conflict, this, this uh, animosity, it's mostly at this top political level. And you have elites that have lost a lot of their legitimacy. So any form of acceptance from the population in general, it's no longer there. And what do they do instead is revert to nationalism, to hate speech, to othering. It's easier to create a crisis than to actually do something that's going to be good for the people and that's going to help the people. So that paints the picture of what's going on inside Bosnia. But what about the role of the US, the EU, and NATO in all of this? They're the guarantors of the Dayton Agreement. The US imposed new sanctions on Dodik for what they called significant corruption and destabilizing activities. And the EU has a small peacekeeping force in Bosnia, currently around 600 soldiers. But some people think that's just not nearly enough and is one of the reasons things have gone this far. What has been mentioned a few times is a deployment of NATO troops. This would definitely help calm down a part of the population, but also send a strong message that there is a red line also in terms of rhetoric that should not be crossed. We have more powers to affect the dynamic in that country than pretty much anywhere in the world. So the fact that we're on that, that things have descended to this level when we have control mechanisms, including uh, an international mandate to maintain peace and security, um, is a real reflection of a, a, a long failing policy. The big shadow over this whole crisis is the fear that it could escalate into another conflict. And Bosnians are all too familiar with the worst case scenario. So even though some people say Dodik isn't serious about following through with secession, just by raising it, he also raises the stakes. Now fear has become overwhelming. Whatever your worst fear is, be you Serb, Croat, Bosniak, anything else, any other self-definition, you think it's more, more proximate and possible than you did at any time since the date peace. People here still have a lot of trauma. So be this IDPs, returnees to places where they are now a minority, all of them feel threatened by this rhetoric. And you can feel this uh, in the atmosphere, in the cities, 
uh, out in the countryside where people are fearful again. And this is something that has changed. If you found that useful, check out our Reason Explainer on what's happening in Ukraine. And if you have other ideas for news stories you want explained, let us know in the comments. See you next week.